Every once in a while, a new TF2 video comes out that's so monumental, so big in its scope, that it can't help but have everyone in the community drawn in with bated breath, anticipating every next sentence. And that video came out two months ago, so here's this. Weapons in TF2 have always been a strange case to a lot of players. By my count, there are 158 non-reskin weapons in the game, for people to sink their little teeth into. Variety is the spice of life, but some weapons taste like salt, and some taste suspiciously like cyanide. It's helpful to have someone to tell you up from down, right from wrong, fun and intuitive to homicidal rage inducing, and that's why I'm here. Today I'm going to be ranking every single non-reskin weapon in TF2 from worst to best. All 158 of them. Now, I'm not the only content creator to have done something like this, take Banny for instance, but I've killed Banny with the Righteous Bison not once, but twice, which means no matter how much comp experience he has over me, all of his opinions are inferior to mine. Now don't be expecting a whole weapon review for each item. I'm gonna be doing this fast-paced and quick to keep the runtime looking a little less like this and a little more like this. My sweet summer child, you had no idea what you were getting into. Not to mention, having the video move at supersonic speed helps me keep the attention of the TikTok addled brains of the youth. My ranking for each item will be determined by a score given for the item's objective practicality and another more subjective score for the item's fun factor for me. So buckle up and prepare for a weapon analysis that would make Uncle Dane himself cry from joy because it's time to start the countdown. The beginning of our ranking journey starts in the burning flames and scorching embers of bad weapon hell, where all of TF2's worst weapons go. Every weapon here is one that has earned a negative score and ranges from bad to atrocious. I bet the gears are turning in your head right now thinking of what could possibly be the worst weapon in TF2. And if a particularly handsome guy with absolutely massive muscles made a four-part video series going over it, but you might be surprised, as I've changed my opinion on what TF2's worst item is. Coming in dead last at number 158 is the stock Fire Axe. What? Now the Fire Axe is far from the best weapon in the game, but it's not mind-blowingly bad to use. At the very least, it's consistent. But the reason the Fire Axe is in dead last is because it's the only objective downgrade in the game. As the third degree is a direct upgrade with no downside at all. So, technically, even the absolute worst of the worst TF2 items have at least a hypothetical scenario where they could be useful, but the Fire Axe, quite literally, has no reason to ever be equipped and is therefore the worst item in TF2. And the second worst weapon in TF2 at number 157 is the Gas Passer. The Gas Passer being this low on the list is about as surprising as finding out drinking gasoline is a bad idea. I've said it once and I'll say it again. It takes a minute to charge in the coordination of your entire team with the average IQ of a lamp to do what the scorch shot and detonator can do with one shot. An absolute garbage waste of a slot. The only thing saving the gas passer from having a 0 out of 10 on the fun scale is the small dopamine rush when I pull off the mug root beer combo. But eventually, the feeling fades and I'm just stuck using the gas passer again. Using the Gas Passer is about as fun as jumping feet first into a meat grinder. However, it is weird that the least usable item in the base game is simultaneously the best item in the game for MVM. Coming in at number 156, we have the Hot Hand. This one being this low hurts on a personal level. During the rollout of Jungle Inferno, the weapon I was most excited for was the Hot Hand. The idea of slapping my enemy silly was absolutely hilarious to me, and the grind to unlock this thing with the contractor took forever, and when I finally got to use it, it was about as disappointing as finding out Santa Claus isn't real. Only to be told, yeah, Santa Claus was real the whole time, but he died in a fiery car crash. Each swing does a pitiful 28 damage and the speed boost lasts one second. It is so absolutely useless. However, if it's any consolation at all, it's gonna be a while before we see another Jungle Inferno weapon. At number 155, the fourth worst weapon in the game is the Stock Shovel. Uh. Actually, no. Four doesn't work. You know what, I've changed my mind. It's actually the Bison. No weapon has been done more dirty in the game's lifespan than the Bison. 
If I wanted to see a fall from grace this hard, I could keep up with Overwatch 2 news. This weapon was always trash, but for some reason Valve has done nothing but nerf it to the point I think it'd be easier to get a kill with an actual nerf gun. The projectile the bison fires crawls at a snail's pace, and if that isn't bad enough, the projectile the bison fires is so janky the damage you deal with it is essentially random. I've dealt anywhere from 22 damage at point blank range to over 100. People complain about crits for being random, but what about the randomness hard coded into the bison itself? The only reason to ever use the Righteous Bison is to purposefully handicap yourself as a meme. And at number 154, we have the Stock Bone Saw. I can summarize in short why you shouldn't use the Bone Saw in three simple words. Use the Uber Saw. I can also summarize why you shouldn't use the Bone Saw in 18 simple words. Use the Uber Saw, Solemn Vow, Amputator, even the Vita Saw. Dear God, use anything but the Stock Bone Saw. I think that pretty much sums up everything I had to say about it. At number 153, we have the Sharpened Volcano Fragment. It lights your enemies on fire, which is good because it finally gives Pyro a close range option to light their enemies on fire, which is something they normally lack. You know it's bad when the TF2 wiki itself gives up and tells you to not even fucking bother with it. But hey, at least it looks cool. So I'll just give it a nice little medal for style points. At number 152, we have the Eviction Notice. Literally every stat on this weapon contradicts each other. The stats for this weapon are so dysfunctional and at odds with each other, it's like bringing up politics around your family on Thanksgiving. You lose health while holding it out, yet the weapon encourages you to hit people with it. The weapon wants you to hit people with it, but it has the biggest damage penalty for a melee weapon. The weapon lets you run faster, but actively punishes you for trying to utilize it. It's so wretched and horrible. Everything the eviction notice can do, its estranged cousin the gloves of running urgently does far, far better. It lets you run faster, hit harder, and has a less significant penalty. The only people who try to use this thing anymore are the people who run the full JoJo Heavy outfit and try to make it work. And Godspeed to them. <laughs> no way, dude! I didn't know TF2 was in real life, I just got the eviction notice! At number 151, we have the Tribalman's Shiv. Another wretched melee weapon. I hate using the Tribalman's Shiv more than Reddit hates children. Deals absolutely pitiful melee damage, but you get to make the enemy bleed. You are absolutely gonna die before the bleed does anything useful, but hey, at least you mildly inconvenience the enemy. I feel like I'd be doing the Tribalman's Shiv a disservice by not mentioning what the weapon is intended for, which is tracking invisible spies. However, cloaked spies have a 50% reduced timer for debuffs, so that 6 seconds of bleed gets reduced to 3. I I've had paper cuts that make me bleed more. Not to mention if the spy is running the get out of jail free card, they won't take any bleed at all. If spies are giving you that much trouble, there are two much better unlocks that do the job a lot better without needing to use this piece of crap. Number 150 is the base jumper. Why be a sitting duck when you can be a floating duck? Trying to use the base jumper is like getting VIP access to getting shot in the face. Every single thing that ever made the base jumper fun to use has been removed over the years. No spamming it in the air to make yourself a hard to hit air menace. No using the cow mangler to turn yourself into a hot air balloon. You seriously have to give up your secondary weapon, or the grenade launcher, to use this thing. And to the people who say to use the airstrike with the base jumper, just use the man treads or gumboats and thank me later. Number 149 is the fists. They're the fists. Heavy is slow and doesn't really benefit from melee combat that much, and even still, there are much better combat oriented heavy melees. I think an important note is that Heavy's bare knuckles deal more damage than the spiked brass knuckles, so that means Heavy has really strong bones, which must mean he drinks lots of milk but that's just a game theory. Number 148 is the Pomsen 6000. It's weird because despite making myself very clear on how much this weapon absolutely sucks, that distaste has over time morphed into this weird post-ironic enjoyment of using the Pomsen. The Stockholm Syndrome I have with this weapon has well and truly taken my mind over. Still sucks though. Number 147 we have the Neon Annihilator. A weapon that in order to get any use out of, requires you to be on very specific parts of very specific maps. Even on maps with water, it really only covers an incredibly small portion of the map. 
You're better off bringing a shotgun, that way you're not gimping your entire loadout to patrol the kiddie pool. Also, the fact that the Neon Annihilator still can't crit enemies covered in gasoline, yet that same gasoline can somehow extinguish allies caught on fire is an absolute crime. One of my personal least favorite and least used weapons in the entire game. Sliding in at number 146, we have the Red Tape Recorder. I really didn't want to get footage for the Red Tape Recorder, so I borrowed some from Chucklenut Cyber Wizard on the one condition that I let him speak his piece on the item. So, uh, have at it. What's up, guys? It's me, everybody's favorite Chucklenut Cyber Wizard, and I'm here to teach you about the best weapon in the game, the Red Tape Recorder. Wait, what, what the fuck is this? It's ranked under the son of the... Who made this list? Alright, so sure the red tape might not be the best weapon, but it deserves more credit than this. So everybody already knows that this thing is slow and can be used to stall and annoy engineers by unleveling buildings and undoing metal storages, which on its own should be put higher on this ranking. But you know what, that's fine, because let me show you guys something that you didn't know it could do. Nope, your eyes aren't deceiving you. The red tape recorder can destroy buildings in less than a second if you sap the buildings as Nenji puts it down. This makes the red tape a lot more situationally strong than people have ever imagined. It's still apparently worse than the sun on a stick, though. So how about that? Is that enough for you the what? Geez, sorry your favorite weapon sucks, Cyber. Heh, <laughs> you're sorry. You kill my red tape and you say you're sorry. Let me tell you something. This ranking didn't upset me. It amused me. Woo, big job in the illustrious The Wet Show channel. A chance to get some clout, ooh, little old me. You have no idea what balance is. You're a teensy weensy little man in a teensy weensy little jar. All right, all right, I'm cutting you off. Oh, don't you fucking okay cyber me. You look down on me, you pity me. Number 145, the sun on a stick. A creation forged from molten magma and brimstone does less damage than a pair of mittens. The main draw of using the sun on a stick is critting enemies set on fire, but even if you see someone that's on fire, that crit deals less damage than a meat shot with your primary would. So what's the point? It also grants you a fire damage reduction while deployed, but if you're running at a pyro with your melee weapon that deals 28 damage per swing, you need psychiatric care. There are better scout weapons that counter pyro. Number 144, the Ulapool Caber. 15 entries into this list and I'm already being confronted with the horrifying reality that I'm already running out of ways to say, this weapon sucks. Hopefully soon we can move on to weapons that don't completely blow. The Caber is an unreliable mess. You can't use it reactively due to the slow deploy penalty. So for some reason, you have to use it proactively, which sucks because the damage it deals isn't even enough to one-shot a light class anymore, and after that, it's back to the resupply cabinet. The only use I get out of the caber anymore is kamikazing into a payload or a point with a shield and blowing up everyone, myself included. Number 143, the syringe gun. I feel like I'm tied to the syringe gun because I kinda caused the prices for them to be jacked up. I feel like there's a joke here to be made about jacking up the prices of medicine for financial gain, but I'm not smart enough to make it, so here's a picture of a clown. As far as medic primaries go, everything is better than the syringe gun. The only reason to use it is if you're a true heroin enjoyer like me. Number 142, the Buffalo Steak Sandwich. Alright, so 9 times out of 10, the steak is one of the worst weapons in the game, but sometimes you get that pocket or uber that lets you absolutely decimate the entire enemy team. Could you do the same thing with the minigun? Yes. But would you have as much fun doing it? No. 90% of heavy mains quit before hitting it big. Number 141 is the Equalizer. When I'm at next to no health as one of the slowest classes in the game, my first thought isn't normally, well, time to get even closer to the enemy. The Equalizer is okay when used under the very specialized circumstances intended for, which is as a last ditch Hail Mary play, but the fact it deals less damage at high health, and how outclassed it is, make it a hard sell for anything other than Minecraft roleplay. Number 140 is the Warrior Spirit. This weapon's harsh penalty is the only thing keeping it this far down on the list. With the highest raw base damage of any melee weapon, this thing can annihilate anyone who's willing to get within range of it. I should also point out how nasty random crits with this thing are. At 254 damage per crit, you can one-shot every class in the game except Heavy, and get pretty damn close to one-shotting everything even with Overheal. It's fun to use with a shotgun, and servers with random crits enabled, otherwise, don't even bother. 
Number 139, The Third Degree. The Fire Axe died for this weapon, only for it to still end up as the 20th worst weapon on the list. For shame. It's the stock axe, except hitting players connected by the medibeam all take damage. You'd have to be stupid to attempt this on a server without random crits. And even if they are on, you're stupid for attempting it at all. I don't even have footage of pulling this off, so here's someone else doing it. Thanks, random person. At number 138, we have the Darwin's Danger Shield. Is there a Scorch Shot Pyro on the enemy team targeting you, and exclusively you, with a vendetta as strong as the force of a thousand suns? Well, then by all means use this thing. But if not, just use Jirati for fire, it's infinitely more useful beyond that. On the plus side, the Danger Shield comes with the hidden upside of reducing a Pyro player's will to live by up to 65%. Also, I'm totally wearing it in this gameplay, don't worry. Yep, totally wearing it. Number 137, we have the Vitus Saw. The Vitus Saw is kind of like the Uber Saw's depressed cousin. Instead of rewarding you for getting a hit with it and living, the Vitus Saw rewards you for getting a hit with it and dying. However, this is probably an unpopular opinion, but I don't like dying, so every day of the week I'm going to choose the option that makes it easier to live. This weapon also earns the Dishonorary No Strange Variant Award, so please, boo at your screen now. Number 136, we have the Shovel. It's more consistent than the Equalizer, but you are still much better off using any other soldier melee. It's sometimes funny to use with the Conqueror's speed buff, but that's about it. At number 135, we have the Sandman. Okay, where do I even start? The Sandman is the worst scout weapon in the entire game. They're not just the worst scout melee weapon, but the worst scout weapon. And you know what? I might even go as far as to say the Sandman is the worst weapon in the game. Because the only upside is it gives you a ball that when you hit people with it, it slows people down a little bit for a small duration. And then what's the downside? Minus 15 max health. You just... That's not a fair downside. And it's even worse because this weapon is an unlockable weapon for Scout. If you get enough achievements, then you get the weapon. You unlock the weapon. So a new player, it's uh, they just take, unlock the, this new weapon for Scout. And then they're disappointed because they play with this weapon for a good long while. And they start to realize, hmm, this weapon's actually a direct downgrade for stock. Fix the same man, Valve. Fix the same man. What you have just heard is the schizophrenic rambling of YouTuber Brickiest Brick. It pretty much sums up what I had to say about this Sandman. You know, just more unhinged and distressing. Number 134, the Bat slash Holy Mackerel. I'm counting this spot for both the Bat and Holy Mackerel because they're reskins of each other, but the whole counting hits in the kill feed thing is enough to get you guys on my case in the comments for not including it. The fish does get the higher fun factor rating than the bat because floppy jiggle bones are funny. They're fine, but outside of memes, you'd be doing yourself a disservice because there are much better options. Number 133, the Bonk Atomic Punch. Drinking Bonk and running past a sentry gun is basically saying to the entire enemy team, I'm going over this way, please come and kill me. Then when the bonk wears off and you're slow as a heavy and have the entire enemy team chasing after you like a pack of angry hogs. It's much better used as an escape tool, but it's not worth giving up your secondary slot for. Overall, a very lackluster item. It's not even that great of a drink either. One sip of this stuff and it tastes fine at the moment, but give it a week and you'll be feeling weird lumps all over your body. Number 132, The Rocket Jumper. The mobility this thing grants you is insane, and it's great for learning the ins and outs of rocket jumping, but sacrificing one of the most powerful weapon slots in the game to use it just isn't worth it, practically speaking. Now I just gotta wait for the oddly passionate troll germains to come and tell me I'm wrong in the comments to boost my engagement. Number 131, The Razorback. Is there a spy on the enemy team targeting you, and exclusively you, with a vendetta as strong as a pack of a thousand angry hogs? By all means, use it! I don't think a spy has actually tried stabbing a Razorback since Crazy Frog was relevant. 
Wearing this thing around your team practically guarantees a spy can't touch you with a 10 foot stick, because even if they try to gun you down, they'll alert everyone around you. However, there's this thing you can do to accomplish a similar effect called game sense. Be aware of your surroundings and don't hard scope unless you have to, and you just saved yourself an entire weapon slot you can use for something that's actually good. Also, I know this gameplay looks like the same gameplay from before, but I can assure you, I'm wearing the Razorback. I, I am totally wearing the Razorback. And at number 130, we have the Classic. If this list was based solely on my enjoyment using an item, this would be near the bottom of the list. Not like it isn't already. I can't stand using the classic. You need to wait to charge your rifle if you want to get any headshots, and in those three and a half seconds, you are left alone with nothing but your thoughts, reflecting on the cold, harsh realities of this world and what it all means. Only to whiff the shot and need to start the whole process over again. All of this waiting to do what the sniper rifle already does, but worse, is enough to smooth out the wrinkles in anyone's brain from mind-numbing boredom. However, the weapon still lets Sniper do his job, so it gets to be this high up on the list. And with the classic done, we have escaped Bad Weapon Hell and entered the depths of the Sea of Mediocrity. Navigating the Sea of Mediocrity is a boring trudge through a slurry of the forgettable and unused. And starting us off at number 129, we have the Mantreads. The Mantreads are close to being a good item, but there's too many problems holding it back. The biggest problem the Mantreads have is that they incentivize you to rocket jump with the ability to stomp and have the increased air control, but there's no reduction in the damage you take from rocket jumping, which means you can only really take advantage of the Mantreads upsides in very short bursts compared to something like the gunboats. That's why it's a go-to item for trollgers and never used outside of it. Number 128, The Liberty Launcher. At this point, I'm feeling pretty tired, so I'm just gonna let good friend of the channel, Eminem, take over for this one. Yo, what's up, guys? Eminem Weapon Reviews here. The Liberty Launcher is one of my favorite weapons to use, but I'll be the first to admit that the Liberty Launcher is sometimes good and sometimes bad. Just like my album's laughing out loud. I always do really well with it when I get my friend out the drain. They go and they can park at me with a crit screen. Thank you for having me on your YouTube channel or what? Eminem out. Man, what a guy. Number 127, we have the Pain Train. If you're on defense, it's literally the worst weapon in the game, giving you a damage vulnerability with no upside. But if you're attacking, eh, it, it's alright. If your idea of fun gameplay is sitting next to a payload cart or watching paint dry, then it's right up your alley. Also, running the Pain Train on Demo Knight is the ultimate power move, and I gotta respect it. Number 126, we have the Blutsugger. The weapon you love when using it and curse when you see your teammate using it. If you're good with it, the amount of self-healing you can do and damage you can deal can be addicting. So addicting, in fact, that just like heroin, you leave everyone else behind you to chase that dopamine high. It's outclassed, but it sure is fun to use. Number 125, The Brass Beast. The Brass Beast lets you do something you can already do well, but slightly better at the cost of being stupidly slow. Running the Brass Beast is essentially begging someone to quickly end your existence with a swift knife to the back or a bullet to the face. The damage the beast does lives up to its name. It sure is a beast. But the beast is hard to tame, and more often than not, it'll just lead to your death. Number 124, the Shahansha. The Shahansha. The Shahansha. This is another case of a weapon being usable with random crits on, and trash when they're not. A random crit at above half health would do 146 damage, which is still enough to one-shot a light class, which is an important damage threshold for a melee weapon to stay above. At low health, a random crit will do 244 damage, which is enough to one-shot everything except a heavy. With no random crits, you can throw all of this out of the window, and you're basically left with a worse kukri. Number 123, the Cleaner's Carbine. The Cleaner's Carbine isn't even good. It's just that it pairs really well with the Bushwhacka, which is just stupid busted. Trying to use the Cleaner's Carbine without the Bushwhacka is like making a PB&J without any jelly. Or peanut butter. You're just eating plain white bread. Getting the Crikey Meter charged up gives you guaranteed crits on your melee for 8 seconds, which lets you absolutely tear through anyone dumb enough to get close to you. However, most of the time you're just left with a significantly worse SMG. 
Number 122, The Overdose. My uncle is actually a huge TF2 fan. My mom told me that he got the overdose IRL the other day, and I think that's pretty cool. If the syringe gun is heroin, the overdose is morphine, letting you adopt the classic medic mantra of run fast and eat ass. The only thing stopping this weapon from being higher up is the fact that it's a syringe gun, and syringe guns suck. Number 121, the Sydney Sleeper. This is one of those classic weapons that's a blast to use and rage inducing to fight against. I always forget how much of a dopamine factory this weapon is. I feel dirty for using the Sydney Sleeper. Not because I'm dousing countless players in piss, but because the weapon forces you to kill for body shots. It's not the most practical rifle, but if your idea of fun is turning your brain off and ignoring the screams of the damned you condemned through your crimes against humanity, sure, it's, it's pretty fun. Number 120, the Sticky Jumper. This item basically lets you no-clip around the map. It's almost stupid how much mobility the Sticky Jumper grants you. However, you are missing out on one of the strongest items in the game and sacrificing half your damage to use it, which more than often than not just isn't worth it. Number 119, the Solemn Vow. By all means a direct upgrade from stock and great for giving your enemy some head. It's a staple for the Battle Medic's loadout because seeing your enemy's health is huge for 1v1s. But I'm willing to bet you already know that Battle Medic is far from the meta, and sadly, neither is the Solemn Vow. Number 118, the Man Melter. Using this item for its intended purpose is an absolute chore. You just wait around for someone on fire to waltz into you so you can earn your crit, and then you whiff said crit because of your crippling performance anxiety, only to repeat the cycle over again. The only times where you get significant use out of the Man Melter is when a Scorch Shot Pyro arrives on the enemy team like the Man Melter Messiah and bestows upon you the power of infinite crits. It should also be noted that the bonus projectile speed gives the Man Melter more range than the other flare guns, which lets you turn into a fire sniper, which is always fun. Number 117 is the Airstrike. The weapon wants to reward you for carpet bombing your enemies, but the reduced explosion radius penalty means if you're not hitting direct hits, you're essentially just pelting water balloons at the enemy team. Also, getting just one kill with the airstrike just makes it a better Liberty Launcher. But don't tell Eminem I said that, he, he gets really passionate about the Liberty Launcher. Number 116, the Scottish Resistance. The Scottish Resistance is a weapon that allows you to do something marginally better that the stock Sticky Bomb Launcher is already good at doing. The added trap functionality is swag, but you're missing out on one of the strongest weapons for shutting down choke points. And all it takes is some idiot with a short circuit to topple your entire defense like a toddler around a Lego set. Number 115, the Backscatter. Its main upside is pretty underwhelming unless you count one-shotting Clueless Sniper's game-changing, in which case I bet you're frothing at the mouth. Overall, it's just a worse version of the Scattergun and Scout's weakest primary. However, a worse version of one of the best weapons in the game is at the end of the day, at the very least mediocre. Number 114, the Hulong Heater. Spent three years in Chinese class and the ironic thing is I'm only 50% sure I even pronounced the name right. Only thing I can actually remember is Wukai Chu Shi Xiao Jianma. That's how to ask to go to the bathroom. With this item, you burn through ammo as fast as a child burns through their parents' credit card buying V-Bucks. However, you get a ring of fire that ignites you nearby enemies. Realistically speaking though, anyone that gets that close to a revved up heavy is dead anyway, so the ring of fire only works as a spy to turn. Which isn't that great, because spies can jump over the ring, stab you, and get away without ever being set on fire. If you're running two or more competent pyros on your team, that's where this weapon can actually shine. Number 113, the Fano War. Does exactly what the Backscatter does without needing to sacrifice your primary slot. The Fano War makes for a great combo with the Soda Popper and especially the Force of Nature. The two already have high burst damage, so when you combine it with the Fano War, you'll be dealing some nutty amounts of damage in the blink of an eye. You'll also send your enemy into the stratosphere if you're using the Force of Nature. Whacking an enemy around your team can also be a death sentence. However, I think it's just outclassed by better options. Number 112, the Delocos Bar. You may know this item because every few months a new glitch is discovered that lets Heavy have infinite health and Valve has to take precious time out of their day watching paint dry to fix it. The bonus 50 health is good if you're a roaming solo Heavy as it gives you a pseudo overheal and bumps up the health you get from health packs, but the fact that bonus health doesn't stack with overheal makes it near useless if you have a medic on your team. With how many of these things you have to choke down in a single match, it's a miracle Heavy doesn't have diabetes. 
Number 111, the Your Eternal Reward. The item is fun to use. You get to rapidly change identity like I did when the authorities found out about the vehicular manslaughter I committed in Pennsylvania in 2017. It's great for chain stabbing, but the cloak penalties are so harsh to the point where you feel like you need to bring the Latron J to get use out of the year at all. Still usable, just with some big hiccups. Number 110, the Babyface's Blaster. You run faster than the car I was driving when I ran over a man in rural Pennsylvania. But if someone breathes on you too hard, you break both of your legs and are slowed down to a crawl. I have a lot better luck with it on maps like Harvest with lots of horizontal mobility, but on vertical maps, don't even bother. Fun fact, this is the part of the script where I'm really starting to regret my choices. How are you editing the what? Number 109, The Home Wrecker. The most use I get out of it is if I walk out of spawn and see a sapper on the teleporter, so I swap to the Home Wrecker and smack it. Then I put it away until the next time. It's a fine choice and power to you if you use it, but I don't typically like being an engineer babysitter waiting for a spy for half the match. This is the part where I mention the bonus damage to buildings, but I don't think you need me to tell you that getting within melee range of a sentry gun is about as dumb as jumping off a building and flapping your wings to try and fly. Number 108, we have the Cozy Camper. Passive health regen and no flinching when at full charge are great, but the lack of a secondary to fall back on and the reliance on hard scoping to take full advantage of its upsides make it pretty outclassed. God, I just realized I'm throwing around the word outclassed more than a video essay channel throws around the word masterpiece talking about a mid-2010s animated movie. Number 107, the Scotsman Skullcutter. Our first item to earn above a 5 on the practicality scale and get a positive score. Demo doesn't have a single bad sword weapon, but the Skull Cutter is the most underwhelming of the bunch. I've long held the opinion that the fact that this sword of all swords has the ability to random crit is stupid, letting you go on a goddamn massacre if the universe is feeling a little extra sadistic in that moment. However, the Skull Cutter's over-reliance on random crits to be effective is really its Achilles heel, because if you're not playing with them on, any other sword will perform better. Number 106, The Holiday Punch. What? Uh... A very specialized weapon, but a fun one nonetheless. If you get a Kritzkrieg medic and have the balls the size of a watermelon, you can stuff any uber push with the power of laughter. You can also do it yourself, which is something many people would consider overpowered, but if you let the slowest class in the game get behind you with their melee weapon out, you deserve every last bit of humiliation that comes your way. Also, the Holiday Punch also has the title of having the only practical taunt kill in the game. However, the fact that random crits do nothing to airborne targets is a surprisingly big downside that can sometimes kill this weapon for me. Number 105, The Candy Cane. I've said some things people might not agree with so far, but I think this is my first definitive hot take of the list. Most people would have this thing in their bottom 5, but it lands pretty high up in my list. The bonus health on kill is great, and especially because you never have to worry about dying to afterburn again. It also synergizes really well with both the Mad Milk and Pocket Pistol, to maximize health from fighting. The explosive vulnerability can lead to occasionally getting one shot by a random pill, but Scout's movement is good enough to dodge a lot of pills and rockets and secure a kill despite the vulnerability. However, say it with me guys, the candy cane is outclassed by better options. Number 104, the Criticola. I'm feeling particularly lazy, so instead of talking about the Criticola, I'm gonna put this shiny little thing in the corner to click on. Go on. Give it a little tap. If you're still here, you had your chance. We're moving on. Also, seeing as this is October when I upload this, consider this your yearly reminder that the Criticola works with spells. Consider that nugget of information your reward for making it this far into the video. Number 103, the Hitman's Heatmaker. A majority of the time, this thing is just a diet bizarre bargain, which lets you have regular small bursts of power compared to the prolonged power of the bizarre bargain but most of the time the bargain beats out the heat maker in practicality. This weapon also had the dissatisfaction of becoming the bot's weapon of choice, a cosmic unlucky fate that would put Pete Best to shame. Who's Pete Best? He was the drummer for a small indie band called The Beatles, who quit right before they hit number one in the US. 
Number 102, the big earner. Stabs let you run fast and do crazy trick stabs, but every attack hits you like a sack of potatoes. Works really well with the Dead Ringer and Latron J to help maximize your damage resistances and cloak. However, the other knives just have more potent upsides that I think beat out the big earner in terms of practicality. Number 101, the lock and load. What this weapon lacks in clip size, it makes up for with its insanely long reach. I love hitting those long range pipe kills and being a bargain bin sniper. The extra damage to buildings is good too, and that alone solidifies it as a pretty good choice for Hybrid Knight, covering your weaknesses towards buildings. I think people really overlook the lock and load. It's not perfect, but it has its moments, and at this point, my muscle memory has been so fried by this thing, I don't think I could switch even if I wanted to. And at number 100, oh my god, the shortstop. Teetering on the edge of mediocrity and being a good item, the shortstop is the golden standard for a mid-weapon. Reloading the entire clip at once, a faster firing speed, and more damage at mid-range are nice. But the shove. The shove, man. We lost bonus health from health packs for this. And with that, we have moved beyond the murky waters of the Sea of Mediocrity. And thank god, because if I had to say the word outclass one more time, I was gonna smash my head into my desk until it turned into a red paste. We have ascended into Good Weapon Heaven, where all of the good weapons reside. Everything in this tier is both fun and practical to use. Starting out Good Weapon Heaven by talking about what is quite possibly TF2's most unholy weapon is probably going to get me crucified, but I swear it was unintentional in just how the cards played out. At number 99, we have the Phlogistonator. This weapon is pretty powerful on its own thanks to the lovely power of spamming flare guns and playing like a little bitch, but then you throw in a pocket medic and the Phlogistonator becomes a team melting machine. El Maxo has single-handedly guaranteed a spot in hell for himself after his last video. Number 98, we have the Stock Wrench. Can you believe the last engineer weapon was 49 weapons ago? When 90% of Engineer's toolkit is good enough to make it into Good Weapon Heaven and above, it should be a pretty clear sign of how strong Engineer's toolkit is. While the stock wrench underperforms a bit when compared to its peers, the wrench makes up for it due to not being as specialized and being a jack of all trades. A great stock weapon that just lacks behind its contemporaries. Number 97, the Cloak and Dagger. I don't like waiting, because waiting makes the voices in my head talk louder, and they really want to go to Chuck E. Cheese for some reason. I like to play Spy, quickly maneuvering around the map, invisible, internally mapping out ammo boxes and fling paths along the way. I don't like sitting around in a corner until their heavy gets distracted. I'd have to be daft to recognize that the Cloak and Dagger doesn't at least have some use, enough to secure its place in Good Weapon Heaven. And is it just me, or do you get really scared when you're standing around the enemy in corners? It feels like paranoid schizophrenia, but the voices assure me I'm fine and some Chuck E. Cheese pizza will take my mind off of it. Number 96, the Mad Milk. If you want to be a supportive scout, this is as good as it gets. You get a free jar of win any team fight at the cost of losing a damage dealing item. However, Scout isn't a class best suited for support, and is best at getting quality picks and flanks. So I think in the end, Scout's damage dealing secondaries are superior to the cum. I, I mean cum. I, ah, I mean cum. I, ah. Number 95, the family business. If this weapon was on any other class, people would regard it as one of their best options. I've sung the praises of this weapon for a long time, and I think it's one of the most underrated weapons in the game. Sadly, people just consider it the funny fat scout meme gun and don't give it a fair shake. I wonder if a 6 foot alpha male with the athleticism of a Greek god made a video on that. Hmm, he wondered to himself, placing his finger on his chin curiously. Number 94, the Amputator. Dudes be like, I wish the medic had an item for AoE healing. My brother in Christ, you have the item for AoE healing. People have the uber saw super glued to their hands so hard they don't even remember this thing exists. Capable of healing lots of people very quickly, it's great for pushing through tight chokes and healing multiple people desperately fighting for your attention. The low damage can suck, but ideally a medic shouldn't need to be placed in a situation where they need to engage in melee combat, which makes the amputator's upsides come into play more than they do on the uber saw. Number 93, the killing gloves of boxing. 
Turns out, giving the most powerful class DPS-wise guaranteed crits on his primary for multiple seconds is pretty powerful. All it takes is one overconfident spy or catching one person by surprise and you can decimate an entire team like it's nothing, entirely by yourself. With random crits on, it gets even better because more times than not you only need the one swing to knock somebody's block off. This item single-handedly stopped the stake from being in the top 10 worst weapons. Only problem is approaching enemies as the slowest class with your melee can be kinda tricky. Number 92, The Winger. If I had a soul, I might feel bad for constantly shilling my own videos on this list, but unfortunately, any semblance of a soul I had disappeared after playing Overwatch 2, so I don't feel a lick of remorse for this. Watch my video on the winger, and if you're in a good mood, watch El Maxo's winger video too. Number 91, the revolver. Placing the stock revolver as the worst of Spy's revolvers is probably my second definitive hot take of the list. I mean, it's good enough to be in good weapon heaven, so obviously it's good, but I think the other revolvers have it beat out in terms of both utility and damage. Number 90, the Enforcer. The Enforcer barely edges its way in front of the stock revolver. It has two incredibly niche and mostly useless upsides, but its main downside is so underwhelming it might as well not even have one. I might be biased, however, as the Enforcer kind of counters a lot of my most hated weapons in the game. Number 89, the Loose Cannon. This weapon is an absolute dopamine factory. Hearing that heavenly double dong sound effect is about as fulfilling as Hey what's up guys, it's your boy Eminem Weapon Reviews here again to talk about the Loose Cannon. Did you know that the Loose Cannon fires explosive? Glowing cannonballs that travel 20% faster than a grenade launcher's projectiles. Cannonballs explode faster than grenades. Only having a fuse of one second, like other grenades. Bombs from this weapon do not explode when hitting players, instead dealing damage. Alright, Eminem, I think they get it. I don't even know how you got back in here. Number 88, the Reserve Shooter. Comboing with this thing as Soldier is insanely satisfying to pull off. And even as a pyro, you can land the dream combo of blasting a Soldier into the air with their own rocket and shooting them with the Reserve Shooter. Although it has way more use on Soldier than pyro for combos, it can also be used for keeping roaming Soldiers and demos in check. Overall, a great side grade to the shotgun, even though it is really only good on one of the two classes it can be equipped by. Number 87, the Force of Nature. The Force of Nature seems to be the type of weapon you either love or hate, and considering it landed itself in Good Weapon Heaven and earned the first perfect score on the certified The What Fun scale, I bet you can guess what I think of it. The boost in mobility the Force of Nature grants from all its knockback related techs is amazing and gives the weapon a really high skill ceiling. Fan jumping lets you go as high as I get when I eat 4 vitamin gummies instead of the daily allotted 2. A good fan scout is an untouchable menace. Also, if you don't use this weapon with the cleaver, you haven't lived yet. Number 86, the buff banner. The ability to give your entire team mini crits for 10 seconds can be an exciting game winning play. Letting the soldier play a more supportive role giving the entire team temporary buffs rewards good team play and personal skill. Unfortunately, for a game called Team Fortress 2, it just kinda ends up being Fortress 2. Even still, the buff banner is a valuable part of soldier's kit. However, the lack of a passive benefit and the other banners having what I consider the better buffs keeps the buff banner lower on the list. While you were doing drugs, I studied the blade. While you were engaged in premarital sex, I practiced the blade. While you spent months at the gym for the sake of vanity, I used the blade. Now that the demons are here, you're all unprepared, except for me for I studied the blade. Uh, number 85 is the half Zatoichi. It's kind of a meme on Soldier, and I love using it on him for that reason alone, but as far as a Demo Knight melee goes, it's actually a viable choice. The overheal you get is nutty, and when you combine it with the resistances you get from shields, you can be nigh unkillable. However, the katana is kind of a diet islander, and I think that sword has more practicality that keeps the katana from reaching the upper echelons of good weapon heaven. Number 84, the black box. It's a box, and it's black. Health on hit is nice, but the lack of an entire rocket in your clip means I don't normally run it without a shotgun handy. Also, if you run the black box with the conch, you have earned the certified weenie award for being an absolute weenie. It has its uses, but having more firepower in your clip, more often than not, is the better choice. 
Fuck me, my- Oh, that was sick! Alright, I can shred to that. Number 83, The Atomizer. Giving Scout a triple jump opens up maps in new and exciting ways, and gives Scout a good tool for maneuvering around enemies. Although other weapons like the Force of Nature and Soda Popper give you more mobility, the fact that the Atomizer takes up the melee slot lets you open up your secondary and primary slots for other items, or double down on the mobility to become an untouchable flank menace. Number 82, The Huntsman. Sure this thing can be a skill-based projectile weapon, but why do that when spamming at a choke point and letting fate decide is far easier and far more fun? For someone like me who tends to find sniper gameplay a bit stale, turning the sniper into someone who can help closer to the front lines is a refreshing new and fun way to play the class. I'm willing to concede that hit scan deleting players is far more effective, but if you do it with the Huntsman, it's gonna look way more flashy. Number 81, The Backburner. The backburner is like the flog for people who want to use the flog, but don't quite feel like becoming a social pariah. Rewarding flanking with full crits on a class that can normally struggle with their DPS output is a huge way to level the playing field for certain pyro matchups. And you can combine the backburner and the thermal thruster to essentially get a free round trip from the enemy's backline. The air blast penalty punishes you for not carefully using your air blasts, which means you're much less of a nuisance to demos and soldiers. Overall, a great solid addition to Pyro's toolkit. Number 80, The Widowmaker. Oh my god, we're finally at the halfway point. I don't even know why I'm still here doing this. This is an entirely a sunk cost fallacy at this point. Are you faring any better editing the what? Anyways, this weapon is capable of absolutely shredding through your enemies, and if you somehow convince a medic to pocket you, you can become a one-man defense. The one caveat to this extreme power is that you can aim. And I mean, come on, my most played class is Pyro. Even if I'm not able to use this weapon to its maximum potential, I'm gonna have a good time pretending I can. A specialized weapon that isn't optimal for a majority of your time playing engineer, but when the opportunity arises, you can shred and tear. Well, uh, now I don't know what to do. Guess I'll, uh, die. Number 79, the Stock Pistol. A great pick for finishing off enemies and a mainstay in the Battle Engineer's Toolkit. The pistol is a well-rounded weapon that covers for the weaknesses of each class that can use it. Although there are choices that I think outclass the pistol on both Scout and Engineer, its overall consistency make it a great choice nonetheless. Number 78, the Cow Mangler. One of the few Dr. Grordbort weapons to crack into good weapon heaven, the Cow Mangler is very similar to the stock rocket launcher but a bit more specialized in its uses. If your team doesn't have a Crits Creek medic and the enemy team an engineer, it's a straight upgrade and you have no reason to not use it. However, when you throw engineers into the mix, the Cow Mangler becomes a more mixed bag. It's still very worth your time and a solid piece of soldier's arsenal though. Number 77, the Tide Turner. This is the item that lets you do the funny trimp. A great shield for maximizing your mobility is Demonite to be a particularly slippery Scotsman. What you gain in mobility, you lose in damage and resistances. But if random crits are on and you're running the Scotsman Skull Cutter, you can do some seriously stupid stuff. A great choice for Hybrid Knight, but when I play full Demonite, I like to maximize my damage and resistances. So even if it's a great weapon, it ranks the lowest of the shields. Number 76, the Machina. If the Flog Challenge secured El Maxo's place in Hell, the Machina Challenge earned him a place in the ninth layer where only the worst of the worst go, like Crazy Frog and Fred Figglehorn. Despite the Sydney Sleeper's mere existence, this is the sniper weapon that somehow earned the reputation of being the body shotting machine. Despite the fact that it is only marginally better at body shotting than the others are, the Machina is also capable of collateral shots, which is an occurrence so rare and so flashy, it makes me refuse to try and get a clip of it even happening, so here is an artistic rendering. Number 75, the Flare Gun. I typically have a lot of respect for weapons with a high skill ceiling, and the Flare Gun might just be the hardest Flare Gun to get value from. It doesn't specialize in crowd control like the Detonator and Scorch Shot, instead dealing burst damage to single targets. Combos with the Flare Gun are equal parts satisfying and effective, which makes it a great piece of game design and a great secondary for Pyro. Number 74, the Charge and Targe. 
The Charge and Targe gives you as much strength and as much resistance as your local PCP addict. With the Charge and Targe, you can just laugh off explosive damage and the Pyro's Flamethrower gets turned into a Tickle Cannon. Then you throw in the passive benefits of each sword, and provided you don't dive headfirst into a sentry gun, you can become an indestructible menace. Number 73, the Thermal Thruster. The Thermal Thruster is so underrated. It's so slept on, it's like it's in a coma. The Thermal Thruster gives a class whose one of their main weaknesses is their lack of mobility, and gives them a jetpack that can rival Soldier and Demo's mobility. Then you combine this with the high burst damage of the stomp, the ability to disrupt the enemy and set them up for easy kills, and the super boop that lets you deny ubers and defend points. Also, I promise this is the last time I shill out one of my videos. Number 72, the Eureka Effect. This is one of those items that's really good in practice, but it just takes a lot of brain power to be good with, and I just can't wrap my brain around this item. Most of the time, I just use the Eureka Effect to do funny sentry spots, although I can assure you it's capable of way more than that. Also, the Eureka Effect has no Strange variant, which honestly should have put this thing near the bottom of the list. Number 71, the SMG. The OG Sniper Secondary and a personal favorite of mine. It kind of lives in the shadow of the Devil's Lemonade, but it's still really good choice as far as self-defense is concerned. The SMG has saved my skin countless times and makes for a great combo with the Huntsman. The Huntsman only deals 120 damage on a body shot, it's great to follow that up with an easy SMG bullet to finish off a light class. A great choice that just depends on the loadout you're using. Number 70, the Quickie Bomb Launcher. The Quickie Launcher is one of my favorite demo weapons to use, because you can turn yourself into a Sticky Bomb Sniper with how well this thing does at a range. It also helps when you're getting rushed down as the reduced fuse time helps you pump out damage faster. It's a fantastic item. I just hope you really like reloading because with that reduced clip size, you're gonna be doing a lot of it. Number 69, the Kukri. Not a whole lot to say here. It's the stock melee, it's consistent. And when I say it's consistent, I mean it consistently always gets random crits, god damn. A little off topic, but here's a fun fact about the movie Citizen Kane. About halfway through the movie, there's a random cut to a screeching cockatoo that jump scares the viewer. The only reason it's in the movie is because Orson Welles wanted to wake anyone up that might be dozing off and not paying attention. So, BOO! Bird jump scare! Are you paying attention again? Okay. Good. Number 68, the Claytomore. What if you could do the funny trim, but longer? Just like the Tide Turner is the ideal shield for hybrid knights, the Claytomore is the ideal sword for hybrid knights. The Tide Turner and Claytomore are like peanut butter and jelly. You can charge around, and since charge is refilled on kill, you can ping-pong between enemies while still having a grenade launcher to fall back on. A great choice. However, I think there are two swords that are better than the Claymore. Number 67, the Dead Ringer. The Dead Ringer makes me feel a hate as strong as a thousand hogs with the power of the sun, but I'll try my best to keep my negative bias out of this. First off, this item is much less about trickery and deceit, and more about having a get out of jail free card you can spam at even the slightest hint of danger. Someone look at you wrong? Right click. Someone hit you for chip damage across the map? Right click. You feel a slightly cold breeze? Right click. With a 66% damage reduction and a speed boost that lets you run as fast as a scout, giving the spy an oh shit button when things go haywire is infuriating to play against but a great utility for the spy using it. And dare I say it, fun to use. I shudder to think about when the Dead Ringer was even more spammable and powerful to fight against. And thank God above it was nerfed. Hallelujah. We have now risen above Good Weapon Heaven. The area we have reached is beyond human comprehension. But what I can say is that there's some damn good weapons here. Welcome to the Ascendant Plane. Our first stop in the Ascendant Plane at number 66 is the Dragon's Fury. It gives the Pyro insane DPS that could put a heavy to shame, all at the low cost of needing to aim. Now that right there is enough to scare off most Pyro players. But those that stuck with it got to tap into a gold mine. Not only is it great by itself, but it covers one of Pyro's main weaknesses by absolutely shredding through buildings. And when you combine the Dragon's Fury with a Kritzkrieg, Lord have mercy. 
Not to mention the Dragon's Fury was patched semi-recently to fix the bug where it could collide with projectiles, so the element of jankiness that held the weapon back is mostly gone. A fantastic choice that rewards skillful play. Number 65, the Back Scratcher. The first in what I consider the holy trinity of pyro melee weapons, the Back Scratcher is a weapon that rewards flanking and has a downside that is easily bypassed. With the Back Scratcher, any health packs you pick up will have 50% more health in them. This means a medium health pack will have 132 health inside of it, which is enough to heal you to near max health every time. Combine this with one of the highest damage bonuses of any melee, and you have a powerhouse of an item for both utility and damage. A rare combo in melee weapons. If you have a medic on your team, the downside may seem daunting, but it's really not. A lesser known fact is that even though the back scratcher makes you take less health from many beams, the crossbow, which 90% of medics run, is not affected at all. So that downside is pretty negligible in the grand scheme of things. Number 64, The Conqueror. Could I ask a random crit? No. Could I ask a random crit? No. <laughs> On top of combining it with the black box to join the weenie club, the conch is also a great utility outside of crutch loadouts. The passive regen helps make soldier more self-sufficient, and the lower damage threshold to blow the conch lets you give your team more buffs than the other banners. Said buff also makes you faster than a medic and gives you health on hit, which you can use to be an offensive powerhouse, or, hear me out, combine it with the Zatoichi to become the ultimate soldier swordsman. The ball's in your court, but I'll have you know one of these options is way funnier. Number 63, the disciplinary action. There is a very tasteless and offensive joke I could make here, and I am above that. But, uh... I'm just gonna put this graph of the most used strange parts for the disciplinary action, and I'll let you make the joke for me, that way I don't have to worry about seeing my name trending on Twitter tomorrow. If you want to make a heavy instantly love you, you can use the whip to roll them out. You can also use the whip to escape or approach with your team. The whip also kind of has one of the biggest hidden upsides in the game, because even though it is not stated in the description, the disciplinary action has the biggest melee range in the entire game for some reason. Number 62, the knife. The knife is a great item that lets you go on a stabbing rampage that will put an angry British team to shame. Spy is a high risk, high reward class, and nearly all of Spy's knives lean into the riskier side, so it's great to have a consistently safer option to rely on. While the other knives have more specialized uses and are debatably better, you can't go wrong with the stock knife. Number 61, the Southern Hospitality. The Southern Hospitality has the Enforcer Syndrome where the upsides are niche and incredibly specialized, but the downsides are so irrelevant that it's just kind of stock, but a little bit better. I explained with the Tribalman's Shiv eons ago how bleed on invisible enemies is underwhelming, but with the downside of the Hospitality being a fire damage vulnerability on the class who's got his ass parked next to a dispenser 24-7, it barely means anything. If you want to use the wrench, but slightly better, here's your pick. Number 60, the Frontier Justice. The raw power of the Frontier Justice with a metric butt-ton of crits is nearly unmatched in TF2. Unfortunately, every time I get to the point where I have over 20 crits, the match is basically over and I get like one kill at max. Even still, a Frontier Justice with even one crit is enough to scare even the most jaded MGE player. All it takes is one free-to-play scout to waltz into the loving embrace of your sentry gun, and you're officially cooking with gas, my friend. This weapon is so darn fun and encourages an aggressive engineer playstyle that I love to use. Number 59, The Ambassador. I... I thought you were dead. My death was... greatly exaggerated. So, you're the punk I've heard about. It's a shame the Ambi got nerfed, but hey. That's just how it is on this bitch of an earth. People love to say Jungle Inferno killed this weapon, but it's still really good. The ability to get infinite guaranteed crits is something not even the Diamondback can claim it has. Just because you can't get cross map kills with it anymore, doesn't mean it isn't a good choice for securing picks or defending yourself in a pitch. It's my favorite spy weapon to use, and it still holds up post nerf as a good part of his kit. This is also the part of the list we are going to start seeing a lot of 10 out of 10s on the fun scale. Number 58. The Spicicle. Speaking of underrated spy weapons, we have the Spicicle. As a spy, all it takes is one single flame particle as deadly as a birthday candle to touch your body, and you have basically been sentenced to death. The Spicicle gives you a fighting chance to see another day. 
Sure, the icicle itself is melted, but I would much rather be an inconvenienced spy than a dead spy. Think about it. No more dying to scorch shots, no more getting unlucky with spy checking pyros, and no more dying to afterburn. It's like a spy's dream come true, why don't I see this thing more often? Number 57, Alibaba's Wee Booties. Demonite is the most fleshed out and rewarding subclass, and without this pair of fashionable footwear, all of it would not exist. It takes a brave soul to forgo not just one, but two extremely powerful explosive weapons and take your enemies on face to face. Not to mention, the variety of swords and shields make Demo Knight a blank canvas for you to paint on. Number 56, the Rap Assassin. The Rap Assassin is a weapon that helps cover Scout's weakness of mid-range combat. The great part is that you get to use this from the Scout's melee slot, which lets you have three ranged weapons at a time. Also, fun fact, but despite not being listed in the description, the Rap Assassin does guaranteed crits with long-range shots, something that's gotten me accused of hacking on Uncle Topia servers. That tidbit of info right there is your second reward for making it this far. Number 55, the Flying Guillotine. It's the Rap Assassin, but better, and in your secondary slot. You can pick and choose what you want to bring with, or you can use them both to become a long-range powerhouse, and have a long, hard laugh at all of the scouts who can't secure a kill outside of hugging distance. This is also one of the most satisfying weapons in the game to get kills with. Getting a kill with the cleaver is just as satisfying as living a long, successful life with the love of your life and dying peacefully in your sleep of old age. So yeah, pretty satisfying. Number 54, the Short Circuit. This weapon is great because instead of soldiers and demos making your life hell, you get to make soldiers and demos life hell instead. They say an eye for an eye leaves a man blind, but Demo Man only has the one, so I've got the advantage. Other than denying projectiles, it's also obnoxious and overpowered when used with the payload cart. Seriously, how evil do you have to be to spam this from the payload? Number 53, the Splendid Screen. Rounding off the Shield Trilogy, we have the Splendid Screen, which I think gives you the best of both worlds. You get the mobility of the Tide Turner thanks to the reduced cooldown between charges, and you also get the slightly reduced resistances and crit swing of the Charge and Targe. If you want to lean more into what the other shields offer, that's a fine choice, but the consistency and power of the Splendid Screen make it my favorite shield and the one I think is the most viable. Number 52, The Bottle. Well, here we have it, the best stock melee weapon in the game, somehow beating out even the stock knife and wrench. It's not more so a testament to the power of the bottle, and more so a lack of alternatives. If you're just running regular Demo Man, the bottle's competition for the melee slot is the Pain Train and Kaber, and a competition like that drives me to drink. However, the bottle can also gain added functionality with a shield, because most swords can't randomly crit, and the bottle can. Number 51, the Persian Persuader. Here we have the second best sword in the game and what might debatably be the most underrated weapon according to me. If you're running full Demo Knight, the Persian Persuader does not have a single downside except for the lack of random crits. But if you're running a shield, it's not like that matters much anyway. The Persian Persuader lets you gain your charge insanely fast and refills on kill, which lets you blow through charge like it's nothing and lets you ping pong between enemies critting everyone in your path. If it weren't for the certain item's shadow that the Persian Persuader lives in, I'd feel confident calling it the best sword in the game. Number 50, the Scorch Shot. People seriously overhate on the Scorch Shot too much. One of the first videos I ever made was a combo montage for Pyro, and in one of the clips I used the Scorch Shot to air shot somebody, and I still get hate comments for it till this day. Like, I get it guys, it's annoying, but it's not that bad. Yo, what's up guys, it's me, Eminem Weapon Reviews again. Just a layer I was talking to my pal Kanye West about a favorite deep fortress to YouTubers, and he said he loves fish sticks, just like fish sticks. I also hate the Scorch Shot. You spam it and it does a lot of damage, and that is certified bullshit. You may not know this but revival was actually a concept album about how much i hate the scorch shit okay i'm in the mouth check out my new team fortress to rap song called bitches on my team 49 the beggar's bazooka the beggar's bazooka is just another one of those weapons i don't have the brain power or will to get good with like you seriously expect me to somehow learn to do this without ever seeing grass or another human face again no thank you I will say though, that in the hands of the few who have mastered it, the Bagger's Bazooka is downright devilish. Number 48, the second banana. This is the food item for a powerful heavy girl boss that doesn't need no pocket medic to succeed. The banana lets you be self-sufficient and heal to near full health constantly. 
It's kind of ironic though, that in the update entirely devoted to Pyro, the joke heavy weapon landed the highest spot on the list. Number 47, the Natasha. In a game as reliant on movement as TF2, having a weapon that can slow someone to a crawl is powerful. Being able to do it to an entire group of people is game changing. This weapon shuts down anyone unlucky enough to be in your range, and brings them down to your level. The damage penalty seems rough, but since enemies are slowed down by your gun, it means securing kills is just as easy, just a little bit slower. The one place the Natasha really fails is heavy 1v1s, because any other minigun will shred the Natasha at close range. A very fun, very powerful weapon to use, just as long as you're not on the receiving end of it. Number 46, the Boston Basher. Here we have the best scout melee. A good rule of thumb is that if a scout weapon has bleed, you're gonna have a good time. Provided you can hit your swings, the Boston Basher is a direct upgrade that rewards you for being skilled. On top of this, the bleed can also be used to bleed jump. And so I can pretend like I know anything about comp TF2, charge a medic's uber charge faster. It's well rounded and provides multiple utilities. It's also the best melee weapon in the game for- Number 45, the Gloves of Running Urgently. Another weapon that people thought got nerfed into oblivion, but is still really good. But unlike the Ambassador, which was unquestionably nerfed, I think the Gru we got in that update is even better than the old version. Now in terms of getting to the front lines, the old Gru was better, because it had no health drain. But as far as general movement goes, the new Gru is fantastic. You can escape without being turned into a red crayon, you can jump across gaps you couldn't before, and you can punch just as good as the other melees, but with the added speed. People seriously underestimate a heavy with their Gru out. Number 44, the Stock Sapper. It feels weird ranking the Sapper on this list because it's less of a weapon and more just one of his abilities like the Construction PDA, but since the Red Tape Recorder exists, I think it's only fair to rank the Sapper too. It's the Sapper. I don't even know what I'm supposed to say, so I'm just not gonna say anything at all. Woo! It's- it's the Sapper! Freaking sweet! Number 43, the Extinguisher. The god of combo pyro weapons and the second part of the Holy Pyro Melee Trilogy. This is one of the flashiest items in the game, letting you do some insane crap that other FPS games wish they could. Extinguisher combos are practically their own genre on YouTube. Outside of combos, the Extinguisher is also great as a finishing tool, especially when used with the Degreaser. Of all classes to get a weapon like this, Pyro is the best because their ability to engage a melee duel on their own terms is unmatched. You can pop enemies into the air or into corners, stun locking them and setting them up for a guaranteed kill. If this list was ranked purely by the pure ecstasy I feel when I get kills with it, the Extinguisher be in the top 3. Now here's Great Blue's opinion on the Extinguisher, because we tend to have pretty different perspectives when it comes to the Extinguisher. The tragedy of the Extinguisher is a tale as old as time. What used to be one of Pyro's best finisher weapons and stronger overall options has been reduced to a laughing stock through its various nerfs. The Extinguisher is one of Pyro's more fun weapons, I'll give it that. Being able to smack enemies for a bunch of damage and speed away is definitely one of the more satisfying ways to play the class. But in terms of raw effectiveness, the Extinguisher is only sometimes slightly better than just continuing to hold mouse one in the direction of an enemy. While the bonus damage based on remaining afterburn is a good idea in theory, in practice it makes it pointless because by the time you've racked up enough afterburn, you don't even need to go for a finisher. Why bother switching weapons and hoping you can connect a melee hit when you could just continue burning him to a crisp and not even risk it? And that's not even to mention the risk you're taking by holstering your flamethrower against clashes like Soldier or Demo, since you can now no longer reflect rockets that you can react to. The extinguisher can be fun, and I'd be lying if I said it wasn't satisfying to ambush a random sniper and just delete him off the face the planet, but now it's outclassed by far easier and more consistent options, and because of that it just doesn't rank too high on a list like this. Number 42, the Battalion's Backup. If the backup's effects only applied to yourself, it would be a great item, but the backup's buffs affect everyone on your team. With the backup, you can resist headshots, sentries, crits creek pushes, and you can laugh off any other damage in the game. It is the ultimate item for pushing through a choke or securing a payload cart one of the best supportive items in the game. Just good luck organizing that push when all of your teammates act like cracked out infants. Number 41, the Ubersaw. Ah, Medic's default melee weapon. Bone saw, you say? What? There's no bone saw. Th there was never a bone saw. Please forget everything you know about the bone saw. Please never speak of the bone saw. There is no bone saw. 
There is no bone saw. There is no bone saw. There is no bone saw. Number 40, the panic attack. It's rare when an unlockable weapon is more consistent than its stock variant, but on servers with random bullets spread on, you know exactly what to expect with the panic attack, and you don't with the shotgun. The panic attack deals over 100 damage per shot, which helps cross important damage thresholds like killing soldiers in two point blank shots. It's reliable, and deals lots of damage compared to the shotgun. It just requires you to be in hair sniffing distance from the enemy. Number 39, the quick fix. This is an item that lets you heal lots of people very quickly. As an American, it's kinda hard for me to understand universal healthcare like that. The utility of the quick fix's healing output absolutely makes it a great item. However, the fact that it has the most underwhelming uber effect out of all of the mediguns does keep it from being higher on the list. If you're feeling devious, you can also use this thing to rocket jump and drop in on people for medic frags. Number 38, the Power Jack. Rounding off the Pyro Melee trilogy, we have the Power Jack. This item lets you run as fast as a kid running away from a smash convention. You can roll out faster, catch up to the enemies, and have more mobility for jumps. The health on kill is the cherry on top of the car battery Sunday. Overall, a great pick for Pyro and one of the best utility melees in the game. Number 37, the Letron J. When I talked about the Cloak and Dagger, I mentioned that I like maximizing being invisible as much as possible when I'm playing Spy. The Letron J not only makes it easier to do that, but also get out as well thanks to the Cloak on hit. It lacks in damage, but it's not too far behind his contemporaries DPS-wise, and the cloak passives are just too good to give up. Number 36, the escape plan. It's almost a Shakespearean tragedy how the equalizer is rotting in the depths of bad weapon hell, but the escape plan gets his spot nice and snug in the ascendant plane. In a perfect world, maybe these two weapons could have been two sides of the same coin. Wait, they were? And it was stupid overpowered? Oh man, wishing the Equalizer was good is like wishing on the monkey's paw, I take it back. Back to bad weapon hell with you, Equalizer, jeez. Number 35, the Direct Hit. Takes everything you know about the rocket launcher and flips it on its head. Instead of being a slow item with powerful splash damage, the Direct Hit is precise and for single target elimination. It's great for giving scouts a one-way ticket to the afterlife and long-range combat that soldier normally couldn't engage in. Thanks to its damage-dealing capabilities and strong pick but Wait, what's happening? Our journey has taken us through many weapons and many realms. Bad Weapon Hell, the Sea of Mediocrity, Good Weapon Heaven, the Ascendant Plane, and all of it has brought us here. Welcome to the Eternal Expansion. From here on out, there is a reasonable case to be made for any item from here on out being the best in the game, and on any given day, the list could change wildly. Welcome to perfection. Number 34, the Kritzkrieg. Well, now that we've reached the highest layer of the list, I'm really gonna struggle to find new ways of saying, yeah, it's really good. Here we have the Kritzkrieg, a staple for pub stomping and racking up ludicrous kill streaks. You can pump any of the worst weapons into this thing, and it would come out good. Except for the Gas Passer, that's that's still irredeemably bad. The Kritzkrieg is the ideal medigun for defending just as the stock medigun is for offense. The two are yin and yang. Number 33, the Gunslinger. For someone who can find engineer gameplay stale and repetitive at times, the Gunslinger offers you a refreshing offensive playstyle without sacrificing practicality. Your sentry gun becomes an accessory to your kit rather than your main line of defense, and your shotgun gets to see some action other than blowing off a spy's face. Not to mention, it turns Engineer's hand into a Bionicle, and Bionicles are swag. Number 32, the Bushwhacker. Valve was like, here's a class that specializes in long range combat but is weak when rushed down, and then just said, just kidding lol, and gave him the ability to insta-kill 7 out of 9 classes in the game at close range. It's stupid busted and antithetical to Sniper's core design. And that's about all I have to say about that, moving on. Number 31. The Pretty Boy's Pocket Pistol. The best pistol in the game. You pump out damage faster and get health on hit for the measly cost of 3 bullets in a clip. If anything, it's too good at what it does, giving you both great damage and utility for little downside. Nonetheless, it's a very powerful and essential part of Scout's arsenal. Number 30, the Diamondback. Everyone tells me this weapon is overpowered and when I fight against it it's super annoying, 
but I can't use it to save my life. I swear to god I get performance anxiety with the Diamondback, and I always whiff every crit shot I get. I can probably count on one hand the amount of crit kills I've actually gotten with this thing. I'm seriously better with the Ambassador. If you don't get anxious looking at shiny imaginary weapons, then this is your pick if you want to maximize spy's damage. Number 29, the Eyelander. The best and first sword added to TF2. While it starts out unequivocally worse than the other swords, this weapon snowballs so hard you become a one-man avalanche. At 5 plus heads, you move as fast as a scout, have more health than a soldier, and can one-shot nearly every class with a shield bash and crit. The only things that keep you in check at that point are sentry guns and a pyro that knows how to right-click. It's the perfect loadout for dominating harvest lobbies. Number 28, the Grenade Launcher. Over time, it's grown to live in the shadow of the Iron Bomber, but that doesn't mean it still isn't a great item. The only thing that would make it better is if Demo would stop being so drunk he'd keep forgetting to reload the final two barrels. Number 27, the Detonator. The king of pyro secondaries. Sure, the Scorch Shot might be marginally better for crowd control, but it can't beat out the Detonator's mobility and crowd control capabilities. You can Flare Jump to Market Garden with the Extinguisher, close the distance to fight an enemy, control choke points with constant afterburn, and open up maps in new ways due to Pyro gaining mobility. It's fantastic, it's versatile, it's the Detonator. Number 26, the Fists of Steel. Take the class that's already good at being really tanky, and crank it up to 100. At any moment, you can take your 300 base health and increase it to 420. And with Overheal, it only gets more crazy. Even with the Overheal penalty, you can still get that 390 Overheal. And with the Fist of Steel, that 390 becomes 546. You can also completely cancel out the Holster penalty by switching through weapons. It provides an insane utility for a class that can often get focus fired and targeted. A fantastic item, and Heavy's best utility melee. Number 25, the Rescue Ranger. As Engineer, your power comes from your supportive buildings, and being able to keep those buildings up and running better makes the Rescue Ranger one of the strongest defensive tools in the game. Being able to yoink a building out of a precarious position and heal at a range while being more ammo efficient can make your buildings feel indestructible, a staple for the defensive engineer's loadout. Number 24, the Market Gardener. Perhaps the weapon with the highest skill floor and skill ceiling in the game. Pulling off a garden instantly drops most targets and it is satisfying as hell. The only problem is getting kills with it is about as addicting as heroin, and if you aren't careful, you can start down a pipeline that ends in you thinking Trollger is a viable class. Number 23, the Jurati. It's really funny and cool that an actual jar of human piss you throw at your enemies somehow slipped into the top of the list. Because last time I tried to throw a jar of piss at somebody, I got expelled from school. Throwing Jurati onto a group of enemies on a point or a cart is essentially winning your team the entire fight. And that's not to mention how great it is for self-defense, whether that be for tracking an invisible spy or using it with the godforbidden bushwhacker. Number 22, the Invis Watch. The Invis Watch really puts you into the shoes of an absent father, disappearing at a moment's notice only to emerge later and stab somebody in the back. It's the most consistent and versatile of the watches, even if it's not the most infuriating to fight against. If you're not trying to be a try-hard trick stabber swipes wannabe that only uses the kunai in Deadringer and has 3,000 hours on spy and zero on grass, I'd say that this stock is the best watch. Number 21, the Crusader's Crossbow. The syringe guns were all designed to be bad as weapons. The crossbow is different because it was actually designed to be good. So is it really any surprise it's the only primary that sees any serious use and is the favorite of the community? It deals incredible burst healing as well as respectable damage at long to mid ranges. The crossbow is everything the syringe gun wishes it could be. Number 20, the Soda Popper. Now I enjoy this item, but I'm gonna let number one Soda Popper enjoy your great blue do this one for me. Because I'm lazy. The Soda Popper is the best scatter gun in the entire game. At least in my opinion, the wet tends to disagree, but it's a damn good weapon nonetheless. The Soda Popper trades off your normal 6-shell slow-firing clip for a 2-shot fast-firing clip that can burst down enemies extremely quickly. The ability to walk up to people and destroy them before they can even react is incredibly powerful, and it makes the Soda Popper super rewarding if you can aim it properly. Since the Soda Popper does the same damage as stock per shot, the nuances between them become pretty interesting when comparing the time to kill. Killing someone in one shot takes the same amount of time with both weapons since they both do the same damage, killing in two shots 
shots is significantly faster with a soda popper because of its faster firing speed. Three shot kills are slightly faster on stock because the soda popper has to reload before firing its third shot, and killing in four shots or more is easier with the soda popper because its firing and reload speeds are just that fast. But that's just damage. This thing has a secondary function baked into the weapon that easily makes it the best shotgun type weapon in the entire game. If you right click, you can fly. What, you thought I was gonna read off the wiki or something? Nope, if you right click, you can just fucking fly around the map with hype. That's barely even an exaggeration. Had it just been a damage comparison, I'd say that the stock would slightly edge out the soda popper because of its consistency. But being able to win any single battle by right clicking makes the soda popper easily one of the best weapons in the game for those who can use it. And considering that it's my personal main weapon, I think I know what I'm talking about more than the what show over here. <laughs> uh, but it's his video and he says, the scatter gun is better, so I'll go leave and grind a corner now. Number 19, the shotgun. The shotgun is one of TF2's most recognizable items and one of the most consistent in its performance. It's a great choice for every class it's on, including heavy, and at this exact moment, I am physically fighting the urge to shell for one of my videos again, but I am repressing it for your enjoyment. You can never go wrong with the shotgun. It deserves its spot near the top. Number 18, the sniper rifle. I mean, what other weapon can whip people into a frenzy on Twitter every day consistently? This item is capable of holding down a choke point or sightline for an entire match, annihilating anyone who dares so much as to peek their head out. Not to mention, even just quickscoping is also capable of insane damage, enough to kill 5 out of 9 classes with one shot alone, and leaves 3 of them on their last legs. It's powerful, probably too powerful in its current state and it has firmly cemented itself near the top of the list, only being beaten out by one rifle. Number 17, the Sandwich. When it comes to both keeping yourself alive and supporting your teammates, the Sandwich is still the king of heavy secondaries. Keeping your team's medic alive is an invaluable service to your team. Being able to heal yourself in a pinch keeps you at the center of the action longer too. It's also a well-balanced, healthy meal. Number 16, the Gunboats. The power of steel-toed boots and wearing the proper PPE transforms Soldier from a slow character with bursts of extreme mobility to one of the most mobile powerhouses in the game. With the gunboats, you can go from one end of the map to the other in the blink of an eye, all while retaining most of your health. If you want to be a mobile, roaming soldier, this is top of the line. Number 15, the degreaser. Yo, what's up, guys? It's Eminem Weapon Reviews here again to talk about the degreaser. As it is, the degreaser is in a strange position. It's objectively one of Pyro's Don't better flamethrowers, since it enables reflecting rockets extremely quickly with its faster deploy speed. But ever since the tough break nerfs, it's not the most consistent. Sure, it's still good for general use, but without the switch speed being universal, the combos you could once pull off are now more of a risk than a general option. But even though it's not as flashy anymore, it's still objectively good. The air blast penalty is annoying, and the one damage afterburn legitimately hurts hurts, but the switch speed bonus combos well with really about everything else in Pyro's kit. Puff and Sting, Quick Reflects, hell, even just switching back and forth between the Degreaser and the Panic Attack like a madman are all great options that are opened up by this thing. If you're skilled at Pyro and have a good reaction time, the value you can get from the Degreaser is incredibly handy. It's not as generally consistent as the stock Flamethrower, and I think in a list like this I'd probably consider it to be worse, but the options it grants are unparalleled by anything else in his kit. So, because of that, it's still one of the best weapons in the game, no argument here. Bro, it's not fair. I wanted to talk about the degracer. Number 14, the minigun. In terms of raw power, the minigun is unmatched. Sure, weapons like the Hulong Heater and Brass Beast are more powerful on paper, but the difference between those and the minigun is that the minigun is actually good. A revved up heavy on a cart or a point is going to be a scary sight to any experienced player, especially if they have a medic to back them up. I constantly flip between the stock minigun and Tomislav as my favorite, but today, the minigun is second banana. But, but not the uh, actual second banana. Number 13, the flamethrower. The best pyro primary at the moment according to me. While the degreaser is great for combos, the flamethrower is a jack of all trades that I believe has more generalized use hence why it ranks higher than the degreaser. It is now in this point in the script, I searched my script to see how many times I used the word great and saw 44. Well, make that 45. So the flamethrower is, um, prominent. There we go. Number 12, the conniver's kunai. On numerous occasions, I've talked about how the kunai and dead ring are used together makes me want to commit a mur- Hold on, wait. Commit. 
liquidation. But if I'm being honest with myself, most of that hatred comes from the Dead Ringer, and the Kunai is just an unfortunate victim of my rage. Spy is a high risk, high reward class, and the Kunai triples down on that. With it, you have the lowest base health in the game, but stabbing any enemy gives you more health than a soldier, which makes getting away insanely easy, especially when you pair it with the 66% damage reduction of the Dead Ringer to get more health than a heavy. Okay, I'll stop while I'm ahead. The Kunai is also really prominent. Number 11, the Medigun. The stock Uber Charge is perhaps the most game changing ability in the game. 8 seconds of complete invincibility to push through even the toughest of engineer nests and choke points. There's only one Medigun I think even rivals the stock and even surpasses its power. So be patient and you'll see it in like one and a half minutes. Number 10, the Iron Bomber. Finally at the top 10. Oh my god. I realized like 80 weapons ago, it would have just been way easier to make this a top 10 list. Making a joke about the Iron Bomber nerf is overdone and low-hanging fruit, but I'm hungry as hell. Oh boy, uh, that, that nerf sure was crazy, huh? What's the deal with, uh, Valve devs these days? A anyways, yeah, the rollers for the Iron Bomber being more consistent puts it in front of the grenade launcher and into the top 10 best weapons in the game. Number 9, the Vaccinator. Finally getting to the single digit numbers now. This and the weapon after it are the two weapons I can confidently say are overpowered in TF2. But considering how many items there are in TF2, the fact that so many of them are mostly balanced to fight against is a testament to TF2's weapon design. Sure, Valve stumbles sometimes and releases a total stinker, but most of the time, every weapon has its own special use. Screw this thing though. God, remove it from the game for all I care. Four charges of near invincibility all at the cost of needing two neurons to activate in your brain at the same time? It is pure trash to fight against. Number 8, the Wrangler. Here's that other overpowered item I mentioned. Now, I won't go into much detail here, as there are much better engineers who can explain the problems with the Wrangler much better than I can, but basically, all of the Wrangler's problems come down to the damage shield that gives your sentry more health than two heavies put together. At the slightest threat, an engineer can pull this thing out and make his sentry gun near indestructible. It needs a nerf really bad, but thankfully, Valve will pull through with the balance update. Any second now. Any second. Number 7, The Bizarre Bargain. <laughs> For as powerful as the stock sniper rifle is, the Bizarre Bargain is even more powerful as any competent sniper can dominate an entire lobby. The Bizarre Bargain even has a hidden stat that for every kill you get, the lobby gets 5% less fun to play in. After two headshot kills, it becomes unquestionably the strongest rifle in the game. And after that, it only gets even stronger. So take everything I said about the sniper rifle and give it a big dose of ketamine. That's basically the bizarre bargain. Number six, the Jag. The Jag is the best wrench. As engineer, you're gonna have your buildings destroyed like they're nothing but Lego sets. But the Jag helps you get up and running faster, which means less downtime and setting up. The faster swing speed also cancels out a lot of what would otherwise be significant downsides. It does less damage, good thing it swings faster. It takes three hits to destroy a sapper, good thing it swings faster. It takes more swings to repair buildings, good thing it swings faster and also the rescue ranger exists. In most scenarios, the Jag is the optimal choice. Number 5, the Tomislav. Here we are in the top 5, and starting us off, we have every Slav Heavy's favorite primary, the Tomislav. Nearly everything to love about the minigun is in the Tomislav as well, with the bonus of being an even better tool for medium range combat. Which is great, considering Heavy's slow speed. It synergizes well with most of Heavy's kit and is great for a Heavy on the go, which is something I can appreciate. One of the very best in the game. Number 4, the Scattergun. No silly gimmicks, no clip size reduction, and no bitches. It's the stock scattergun. The scattergun is a basic no frills shotgun, but just because it's basic doesn't mean it's bad or boring. Far from it. Learning to maximize use from the scattergun and have unpredictable movement is one of the hardest but most satisfying things to learn in TF2. Lining up those glorious meat shots and getting those key picks. One of the most powerful and important weapons in TF2. The nail gun would have been better though. Number 3, the Sticky Bomb Launcher. 
eight highly powerful explosives all in one glorious weapon. The sticky bombs are so versatile and useful. You can use them for their namesake and create traps, you can use them in a 1v1 as a highly powerful mid-range weapon, or you can spam them down a choke point without even looking, just watching the kill feed. And if you get a Kritzkrieg Uber, you're gonna turn the number 12 into 0 very quickly. In terms of pure and utter destruction, the sticky bomb launcher might be the peak. But I think two weapons have it beat. Number 2, the rocket launcher. The rocket launcher is a little bit of everything. Not only is it an extremely powerful weapon capable of destroying any class in the game, but it is also one of the most powerful and famous tools for mobility in gaming itself. This weapon has solidified Soldier as a generalist class and one of the most meta-defining classes in competitive Team Fortress 2. It's because of its power, mobility, high skill ceiling, and general use that the rocket launcher is the best weapon in TF2 and the very top of the Eternal Expansion. Wait, this is actually number two. What's number one? Number one, the original. Turns out, the best weapon in the game is the original, for all of the same reasons as the rocket launcher, and also because it is ever so marginally better at corner peeking, pogoing, and because it looks like a penis. Congratulations, original. I found the least original weapon to put at the top of my list. Man. Whoever thought that the best weapon in TF2 would be a- Weapon reskins in TF2 